Dear learners, I am Dr. Jayanti Datta from Human Resource Development Center of Punjab University at Chandigarh. This is the course on Pedagogical Innovations and Research Methodology and we are doing the module on Mechanisms of Paper and Thesis Writing with Integration of Technology. Dear friends, academic research is an integral part of the professional life of faculty of any higher education institute, college or university. Teachers are themselves conducting research and also mentoring students towards research degrees of PhD, MPhil or other minor research projects at the postgraduate level. Academic research finally appears in the form of academic papers published in professional journals, theses and dissertations. Mastering the mechanisms of academic writing is a crucial survival skill for teachers and having a handy guide to these mechanisms can also help them in training their students in research competencies. This module presents a brief and practical understanding of structures and methods of academic writings. After going through the module, the learners will be able to comprehend the difference in the aims of a research paper and a thesis, comprehend the traditional structure of academic writing, know about the qualities of a good academic writing, and know about the use of technology in academic writing. Academic writing is a writing used for communicating scientific knowledge. It can be differentiated from creative and journalistic writing by its evidence-based style of presenting research findings, objective approach, analytical methods and formal tone. It can be in the form of books, research papers, monographs, theses, etc. The difference between a research paper and a thesis lies in the aim of the two. A research paper is written to document a research work through publishing it in a research journal. The purpose of a research paper is to document the significance of the research question, explanation of the research process and declaration of the findings. Through this, we share our research findings with our professional peers in an authentic and acceptable manner. A research paper is neither submitted for acquiring a qualification nor evaluated for granting a degree, but it has to pass through evaluative steps of peer reviews and editor's assessment in order to get published. The objective of writing a thesis is to show to the examiners that the student has carried out and documented the research work as an evidence of learning outcome. It is an evidence of students' achievement of research competencies. The thesis is thus a document prepared and submitted for assessment and accreditation and hence thesis writing should be impressive, presentable and facilitating for the evaluator to assess the document. Research paper and thesis are thus different in their scope, span and scale. A research paper is usually restricted to approximately 3000 to 8000 words as specified by the professional journal in which we intend to publish it, while a thesis is more voluminous and vast. A research paper is submitted to a professional journal and if accepted, is published by it, while a thesis is prepared and published by the researcher himself or herself as per the university's protocol and further submitted for evaluation. There are many similarities between a research paper and a thesis also. Both are academic writings and both document research, work done by the researcher first hand. Their composition is also similar with sections sequenced in similar fashion that is introduction followed by literature review, methods, findings, discussion and conclusion. We attempt to write a research paper or a thesis after the research question has passed through the steps of crafting of research design, generation and collection of data, analysis and finally reaching at the new findings which could answer the research questions. Now before the actual act of writing, we have to get ready for writing. There are certain physical acts that we have to complete and some mental actions that we need to do to be prepared for writing. It is assumed that the following stages of our research work have been accomplished before we embark upon the writing process, that is framing the research question, developing a research design, collecting and going through previous literature in the field, generating data, conducting experiments, doing field work, data analysis and arriving at the results. 
Equipped with all the requisite content, now we are ready to put pen on paper and actually write our dissertation. Through reading, reflecting and discussing, we must have developed clarity of understanding in our mind about how the different parts of our research have developed from the foundation and have built upon one another. We can also create a flowchart, a mind map or an outline of our writing. This will help us in bringing consistency and coherence in our writing. Before writing a research paper, we should have identified the journal in which we intend to publish our work. By going through the back issues of the journal, we would be able to understand if our paper matches with the domain of the journal so that it has more chances of getting published and also getting noticed by the peers working in the field. Instructions for contributors or guidelines for authors are provided in all the research journals. We need to attentively go through these instructions in order to design our paper in the correct format – length, font, font size, style, formatting, referencing style – all has to be done according to the specific instructions, otherwise the paper will not be accepted for consideration. For the format of dissertation or thesis, we must be familiar with the guidelines issued by respective universities which are to be followed strictly. Now, going about the structure of the academic writing, traditionally, the structure of the research writing, both of a paper and a thesis, includes sections of introduction, literature review, methods, findings, discussion and conclusion in this specific sequence in the main body. The title, abstract and keywords obviously precede the main body. We would now explain the different sections and parts of the research paper and thesis one by one. First of all, let us discuss the title. The objective of creating a good title is to give to the reader an idea of the content of our research paper or dissertation in a single glance. The title will be used for abstracting and indexing by different databases. Hence, it should contain words and phrases which will help the reader to access our papers. Hence, it is important to frame the title in a clear, concise and unambiguous way. Good titles are simple but attention-grabbing. Conventionally, titles include words related to the topic, purpose, methodology, theoretical positions, subjects, place and time of research. There are some examples of a thesis title. For example, in the following statement, which is a title, Pathak Binay Kumar, 2008, Information Asymmetry in Higher Education Market, a case study of two engineering colleges of West Bengal, which is an MPhil dissertation of Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. If we analyze the words in the title, we will find that they relate to information asymmetry in higher education market is the topic, a case study is the methodology, two engineering college is the subject, while West Bengal is the place. Let us take another example of a research paper title. Matthew E. T. and P. R. G. Nair, 1979, Demand for Higher Education, a Socio-Economic Profile of Evening College Students in Kerala, which has been published in Journal of Kerala Studies, 6 March to June. Words in title related to are Demand for Higher Education is the topic, a Socio-Economic Profile is the purpose, while Evening College Students Tell us about the subjects and Kerala is the place where the research has been taken place. The title should be a perfect fit for the research we have done. Hence, it is advised in case of research papers to first draft a working title and once our writing is completed, then to check once again if the title matches our final presentation and refine it accordingly. In case of dissertation, one needs to submit the title for approval before the research approval committee, hence it should be refined before being finalized. The next important section is that of abstract. Abstract is a short paragraph that appears first in the reading sequence, immediately after title and author details and before the introduction. Abstract is distinct from the main body of the paper and is a complete composition in itself. It is a standalone unit and it does not transition into another section. A reader's decision to read the paper often depends upon whether the abstract is clear and interesting. The reviewers, editors and evaluators 
base their first opinion on the basis of the abstract. Hence, it is important to write such a paragraph as is short but self-sufficient and by reading it, the reader gets a fairly good idea about the theme, research process, outcomes and interpretations of the research work in a quick but succinct manner. For writing the abstract, we have to write brief statements demonstrating the purpose of research, aims, hypothesis, research questions, research methodology, data collection tools and experiment de details. Findings, outcomes and results followed by conclusions are also mentioned in the abstract, but discussion and interpretation of results are not given in detail. The main aim of writing an abstract is to compress the paper into one short paragraph so that the reader gets the idea of the usefulness of the paper by reading the abstract. The length of the abstract of a paper is determined by professional journals in which we intend to publish and is directed in the instructions for the authors. In the absence of any clear word limit, an abstract should be about 10% of the length of the research paper. It is advisable to write the abstract only after the completion of paper writing. Abstract is not written in thesis. In many journals, the format demands that a few important keywords be provided in the research paper. Usually, 6 to 8 keywords are given in a paper. Keywords are words which are important for understanding of the research work and are used very frequently in the paper. These are indicative of the domains in which our research project falls. Keywords and phrases are picked up by databases and lead other readers and researchers to a specific publication. Hence, these should be well thought out. Keywords should neither be chosen from a very broad base nor from a very narrow slice of our research area. There can be some examples. Let us say a research paper which is titled Public Health Research in India in the New Millennium, a bibliometric analysis published online in Global Health Action by different authors has the following keywords. Public health research, research capacity, research systems, health research funding, bibliometry and India. In another example, a research paper titled A Feminist Peep into Public Art in India's Northeast published in Antyaja, Indian Journal of Women and Social Change has the following keywords Public Art, Patriarchy, Northeast India, Queer Feminist Analysis We come to the next section that is the introduction all compositions begin with an introduction, which primarily introduces the reader with the theme in hand. Traditionally, introduction gives a background or overview of the research project that we have taken up. It starts from a broad base and narrows down to reach the specific domain of research which we intend to work on. Introduction is a section where we provide a detailed background of the problem, indicate any uncharted areas in the literature, give justification for our selection of the research problem, state aims and objectives of our work, and also situate our location in the whole scheme. It gives a context to our research problem and frames it within limited coordinates. The background or overview is explained with the help of clarification of definitions and development of the domain by citing previous researchers. We highlight the gaps and lacunae in the current understanding of the domain and lead the reader towards the rationale of our research project. Context setting is done by declaring the spatial, temporal, geographical, theoretical, procedural and methodological limits of the research work that we have undertaken. If required, hypothesis specification is also done in this space, describing concepts, assumptions and principles, reasonings leading to hypothesis. Aims and objectives are mostly written in points and are sentences which start with phrases like to develop, to identify, to explore, to measure, to explain, to compare, to determine and to assess etc. The next section is of literature review which simply means a section where we bring up all the previous research work in the domain within which our research topic falls. It is not a mere chronological collation of publications done in the previous years 
but is a coherent and consistent presentation of all knowledge generated in the field which becomes the foundation for our research project. Through literature review, we put forth an argument in favor of the salience of our research question substantiated by earlier research. By presenting the literature in such novel sequences as corroborates our research hypothesis, we bring fresh understanding of the topic and novel insights in the field. The usual pattern of writing a literature review is to first provide a brief gist of the earlier research and then to correlate it with our research question by justifying, debating, comparing, connecting, negating or approving the earlier work. This process can be done several times over, starting with clarifications on the definitions, main concepts, methodological approaches, theories, findings and results. Literature review also highlights the strengths and weaknesses of the previous research, how our research would address them, similarities and differences between previous research and our work, how prior findings support our project and what difference our research work would make in the field. Previous literature also needs to be cited in some other sections of, for example, introduction, discussion and conclusion where the objective is to corroborate validate and confirm our arguments with its support. Correct citations should be given in literature review not only for giving credit but also for the reason that other researchers can access those publications if they find them useful. Details of how to organize our literature and manage citations with the help of technology have been dealt within subsequent modules. The very important section of methods is now being discussed. The complete information of the methods that we have employed to work on our research problems is re recorded under this section. This information is very significant both for readers and evaluators because through it the validity and credibility of our research work will be gauged and assessed. If our methods are flawless and perfect then our findings will be correct and our interpretations and arguments will be credible. Methods include straightforward information about population, sample, sampling techniques, data collection methods, experiment details, etc. Limitations and delimitations of our study are also included in this section because we need to enlist all factors that impacted our research process and results. We have to be honest and straightforward in our disclosure and we must justify how we have done our research. This lends credibility to our research process as well as to our findings. Findings or results, as the name suggests, include all the results, answers or solutions that we have found or arrived at in response to our research questions. In this section, we report what we have found without going in the detailed explanations. Findings are in the form of statistical data in quantitative studies. These can be presented in the form of tables, charts, graphs, pie diagrams, histograms and such other aids. We should be clear in our mind about when do we need to present our data through any specific aid. Tables and graphs should facilitate the reader and lead to a clearer understanding of the data without going into long explanation. The following table gives an indication of when to use a specific kind of graph. For example, tables are used when we need to summarize the relationship between a number of variables. Bar graph is used to present nominal variable, pie graph is used to present nominal variable, a line graph is used to show change over time, while a clustered bar graph is used to compare the distribution of nominal variable for two or more groups. Histogram is best to present the distribution of interval and ratio variable. Histogram with normal curve presents the distribution of interval and ratio variable with mean standard deviation and plotting of a normal curve while scattered graph is used to plot a ratio variable against an ordinal variable. Each figure should be numbered consequently and brief notes can be provided to explain some feature in the data. However, long wordy explanations of the obvious features of the figures should not be given. The next section is that of discussion. The findings and results of our research present certain patterns before us. New pictures emerge out of the data that we have generated through our experiments on research work. New insights are developed 
and new perspectives are unraveled when we interpret our findings. It is in the discussion section that we attempt to join the dots. Findings are used as evidence to substantiate our hypothesis, to present implications and to highlight the significance of our arguments. Discussion gives to the reader what the findings mean. Discussion emerges from the findings and is done in the light of previous literature. In discussion section, we discuss the findings and results by analyzing them, interpreting them and highlighting their implications. Here we describe how the results of our study cover the gap and lacuna which we have aimed to cover when we started with our research project. How through our results and their interpretations we have achieved our objectives. Through these descriptions we establish the significance of our work. In this section we also discuss how our limitations have constrained our findings thus indicating scope of future research in the area. In case our results indicate certain predictions, recommendations or change in practice, these are also presented in the discussion section. Discussion transforms the data into generalizations and explanations step by step. The first step comprises of presentation of the data along with explanations of relationships between variables and different aspects of the analysis. In the next step, relationships within the data is discussed and interpretations, implications and patterns are extracted from this. Finally, based on the data, inferences are drawn to explain the answers to the research question. Finally, we come to the conclusion section. It is very important to conclude and wind up the paper in an effective way by giving the readers a neat rounding up. There are different ways in which a paper can be concluded. Firstly, it can summarize the main issues raised and explained in the research paper and help in reinforcement of the ideas. Secondly, the conclusion can also be a demonstration of fulfillment of the objectives and can include an evaluation of the research in terms of the degree to which the aims and objectives were achieved. Thirdly, concluding paragraph is also the place where we can point out to the aspects of research which have not been attempted and the limitations of the study and wherein the scope for further research lies. If relevant to the specific research work, suggestions and recommendations for action and practice can also be included in the conclusion. No new ideas are introduced in the conclusion chapter. Conclusion is framed on the basis of contents already written in the earlier sections and it is a platform where we link our findings and interpretations with our research questions aims and objectives by summarizing what our research has come up with. In this last section, we can present the experience of our research journey, reflections and insights that we have gathered as a researcher. This can show how our understanding grew along with the research process and how insights dawned upon us or how we surpassed the roadblocks. This final submission can be of help to other researchers and complete our academic writing as a genuine contribution to universal knowledge. Sometimes there is a section of acknowledgement also in a research work. No research is done in isolation. We take the help of several people along our research journey. We take institutional support and use assistance in several forms. Our research might have been funded by a certain agency. Our supervisors mentor us. Librarians, lab technicians and fellow researchers help us with their expertise and family members and friends support us by proofreading or giving feedback. In acknowledgements, we show the courtesy of showing our gratitude to all those who have helped and supported us. Contents is a section which is usually present in a thesis. In a thesis, it is mandatory to provide a content page where all the contents are listed along with the page number where they appear. This also includes a list of figures and tables and acknowledgements. Preparing the content page is the last thing to do during the compilation of the thesis and should be done in a careful manner. Dear learners, now we come to discuss the qualities of good academic writing. The first quality is that of conciseness. An impressive academic writing is concise and contains not even a single superfluous sentence. Brevity should be practiced when writing research works because it helps the reader to be able to quickly reach the crux of the matter without wading through a lot of unnecessary verbose text. 
To write in a concise manner, one needs to continue to edit and modify the draft unless the desired succinctness is achieved. The second quality is that of logical rigor. The foundation of good academic writing is logical rigor. The thread of consistency should run throughout the complete text. Irrelevant and purposeless words, sentences and phrases should be carefully weeded out by checking the writing for thoroughness. Coherence is also a very important aspect. Coherence means the connectedness of the written communication. The seamless flow of one section of writing into another, one paragraph into another and one sentence into another demonstrate coherence in the language. In good academic writing, the different parts of the composition do not jarringly stand apart from each other but are logically built upon the previous section and hold the hand of the following section. There should be clarity in the writing also. Clarity in written communication comes from clarity in one's ideas. If our thinking is muddled, we cannot bring lucidity in our writings and tend to write in ways which are confusing, fuzzy and ambiguous. Academic writing serves the purpose of dissemination of innovative ideas only when it is clearly written and every reader derives the same meaning out of it, which the author researcher has intended to convey. The communication should also be simple. Muddled thinking also gives rise to complications in writing and we tend to convolute unnecessarily. Good academic writing is simple in structure but sharp enough to carry the complete message. Use of jargon, dense language and obscure paraphrasing are indicators of complicated writing. Needless to say that there should be correct grammar. The language we use in writing our paper or thesis should be completely free of spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes. Electronic spell check and grammar check tools are already there for automatic correction. However, we also need to work manually to weed out any mistake that has not been detected electronically. Technology tools in academic writing. A number of applications and software tools and solutions are available which are easy to use and offer a foolproof and effective support in different stages of academic writing. Out of several such options, a brief indicative list is provided here. In the above sections, we learned about the structure of research paper and thesis and qualities of good academic writing. By practicing them, we can master research writing skills and it would become more and more easier to produce quality research papers and publish in high quality professional journals. All the best for an exciting research writing journey. Thank you very much.